Okay, back again. We had left off saying that as he was sitting, is not in, is not being used by Paul. He starts with on. All right, and this total here then becomes 91. I'm going to click now so you can see the text. Starting with the word on, Paul puts his starts his eulogetos hoteos kai pater in uh, Ephesians 1:13, 1, 1, 3, and he he packs it there. Now, what's really interesting about that is, you know, praise be to the glory of the Father and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ versus what the disciples are actually saying. Tell us when these things are happening and what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age. In other words, they're not praising God. They're, look, they're drooling over signs. I'll be covering a lot more about that in episode 13, or comment 13, which is what I'm calling it right now. Um, so, Paul is being satirical, and we already knew he was satirical about the emperors, but now he's setting up the theme of being satirical about Christians. And that's how the rest of his thing goes. Okay, it's a ripping satire with the idea of the doctrine that Christians cause history. It's a ripping satire on how, you know, the good, when the emperors are good, it's because the Christians are growing. When the emperors are bad, it's because they're not. And we have, unfortunately, so much writing about what Christians were thinking that we can pretty much see how that satire comes to pass. And we have a whole lot of writing about the emperors, too. And it's not too hard to get with retrospective, you know, study on our part, what Paul was talking about. And I mean, the satire is so biting in Paul that he has one of the, one of the key words he uses in his passage is telematos. The tele part of telematos is the death of an emperor. The first time he uses telematos, the emperor that he's marking the death of is Trajan. The second time, the emperor is Macrinus. The third time, the emperor is Diocletian, and it's because of Diocletian that Constantine comes to power, and Constantine is the guy who took everything that Diocletian had set up for religion, and then just slapped Christ's name on it. Hence, the Catholic Church. I mean, everything in Catholic Church today stems from what Diocletian invented for pagans. I'm dead serious. Right down to the word diocese. That was Diocletian's word for a governmental district. The purple, the red, the ceremonies, the whole bit. Just change the name to Christ and a couple other minor details and you've still got Diocletian in effect right now. If you want to know what it was like to live during the time of Diocletian or Constantine, well, just look at the Catholic Church because they basically copied it all lock, stock, and barrel. Which isn't really they because there wasn't a they then. It was Constantine. Constantine wanted to get the bishops underneath his, what do you want to call it, thumb. So he insisted that all their little conclaves and councils be under his aegis so that he could monitor it and control it. And then, of course, after he died, then all those so-called bishops that were in Rome said, oh yeah, we got control over the sons now. And the sons were little pissants. They killed each other. The first thing they did before their dad was even in the grave for five months is they went around killing all their male relatives until there was just three of them left and a couple of cousins. And none of those children had issue that lasted beyond the second generation. You know, four generation curse, you've heard of it. Yeah, well. And Constantine himself is parodied by Paul, but I show that in the Pauline, you know, in the Paul Meter GGS 11 videos in Vimeo, and I got the similar ones are in um, YouTube, but they're better viewed in Vimeo. So when Paul's doing this, he's being real precise. And this is full circle to his own time. And he starts this on the Mount of Olives at Christ's birth. 
not at his death and his birth. It creates a timeline, therefore, that's out of sync with the timeline here. And I think I know why he's doing it that way. Okay? But the point is, is that Paul's timeline goes all the way down to here. Okay? And then he stops. In Paul's timeline, this stopping point where you see the word cloak, see right here the word cloak, um, in Christ's timeline, because he's doing a timeline here too, he's doing three of them. In Christ's timeline, this is 590 AD. Okay? It's the end of the voting period, the first 490 after his death, and then 70 year voting period if you seen the genius.xls videos or um, the worksheet then you know what I'm talking about this is 590 AD at the word cloak hemation actually and that's not the end of the verse in Greek okay the, the Greek has a couple of words after that how to for example but the point is is that at the end of this verse it's 590 AD in Christ's timeline but it's 434 AD in Paul's timeline. Now the other thing, well, it, it doesn't even, yeah, it does. It goes, it goes there. It's 434 AD in Paul's timeline. Now the other, th there's more than one way to look at this. The other way to look at this is, yeah, this is the 434 syllables, but instead of saying that it goes all the way in of that timeline, if I just count the syllables in Paul. Okay, without, you know, stretching it. That is where Paul's actual meter stops. If I, you know, you overlay the Pauline meter in Ephesians 1, 3 through 14 over the, the now blue highlighted text um, here in Matthew 24, that's exactly where it stops. And it's really interesting because if we're saying that this ends at 434 A.D. in Paul, Notice it says it's not even getting to the end of the sentence. How do I stop this? Whoever's on the housetop must not. That's it. He won't even finish the sentence. Because look, then those who are Judea flee to the mountains. Whoever's on the housetop must not. Just stop there. Now why is that important? If he's ending it at 434 A.D., it was one of the worst times to be a Roman. There was a stupid woman in power called Pulcheria. Pulcheria in Latin kind of means beautiful. There was nothing beautiful about her. She decided to claim that she was the real mother of God. And that's where the stupid false doctrine of Theotokos comes from. She started claiming that she was the mother of God. Which means if you disagreed with her, then guess what? Your head didn't stay on your neck very long. It was a, She began a period specifically of um, anti-Semitic persecution. And of course, persecution of any Christians who disagreed with her at this time. So it's like, hello? Just at the end of this timeline, just get out. That's why he stops it there. It, it's like a cliffhanger. See, especially with the must not. Because, see, the readers, the, the Jewish readers or the Christian readers who were trained to do syllable counts, they would know it stops here. And it's like, oh, wow, whatever that time is, just jump. Don't, don't even be in the Roman Empire at that point. It's just get, no, don't just on the, on the housetop, not. In other words, don't even be on the housetop by that point. Okay, he's drawing parallel to abomination. And I mean, how much more abominating can it be in 430-some, I think, I think she started it in 431, started making that claim. She started controlling the priest, she started controlling everybody, and she claimed to be the mother, ever-virgin mother of God. Well, you don't get more abominating than that. See, abomination has more than one meaning. Okay? She was just, it's just, you know, when the women run the show, I, I'm sorry if I sound like a misogynist here, but if I'm female, I guess I get a special dispensation to do so. Whenever the women run the empire, 
it's not good. Christ would, you know, God explained that with the, you know, the judgeship of Deborah. Everybody was so bad that a woman had to do it. Okay, that's, that's really meant. And, you know, if you're female and you take offense at that, then please go listen to somebody else. I don't have time. You know, a person, any female can display the Bible. That's not teaching. And I frankly don't believe in women running politics you know for political office either or maybe I'm wrong about that but honey you don't want them running an empire and you certainly don't want them claiming they're the mother of God so yeah get out just go don't even be on a house stop by this point not he didn't even finish the sentence now if that's 434 from here that's where the text stops stops in Paul that's where it stops if I were to just overlay the start of Ephesians 1 3 through 14 to the end of verse 14 just overlay it on the same syllables in Matthew 24 that's where it stops and in episode 13 and following I am going to go through some not all of how that overlay works so that you can see that Paul is paralleling the actual text that's highlighted now in too dark a blue with what he's saying for the period he's saying it and the words here in Matthew elaborate on in a really biting sarcasm for the period that Paul is using so basically what he's saying is hi these words in Matthew are going to have an actual historical parallel during the period that I'm covering in my meter and then it's basically Groundhog Day from that point on. In other words, when you get down to verse 17, it doesn't get any better. It's going to just wash, rinse, and repeat everything Paul wrote. But the change of the names of the emperors, and the change of the names of the Christians, and the change of the names of the kinds of apostasy and stupidity that they get into, and a change of the names of the ways that they abominate the faith. is isn't going to get better. That's his message in Ephesians. But, when you're down at this point in the Matthew timeline, or I'll say the, the Matthew 24 timeline, this part here, okay, well, from here, from here down, right there. I don't know why it didn't stay. To here. In the Greek, that's 35 syllables 35 and the end of that sentence the end of that too dark highlighted blue is 560 which translates into 590 AD so the other parallel from Paul is that by the time you get down here that also parallels to 555 AD 35 years prior not merely 434, but also 555. Okay, because in the Matthew timeline, this is starting at 30. And when you get back to here, you're looking at 590 AD. You count back 35 syllables. And that's the part that Paul leaves out. So he's paralleling 434 AD and 555 AD. Okay. Now there's another aspect to this, but I think I'm going to have to take a break before I explain it. Play with this as much as you can. I'm sorry that this is so complicated, but you know one thing it's telling you? We can prove that we have the right Bible words because of the surgical precision in Paul. Therefore, the Matthew Gospel we got, Paul had. 